in the tank right now, so that makes it actually very cheap uh, to go there. And I spent an entire week down there with people from Brazil last year at this time, and the word Zika didn't get mentioned even once. And so what's happened is the Zika virus has come on the scene very, very quickly. And for reasons that I'll explain, it's a virus that we know nearly nothing about. And so uh, because I was studying it just a couple of months before it hit the mainstream media here in the US, that made me uh, the de facto expert because I knew just a little bit more about Zika virus than most other scientists and most other people who are studying viruses. And so I'll share with you some of the work that we've done at UW-Madison, as well as hopefully allay some of the fears that you might have about Zika virus. And then after we're done, I'll be able to take any questions that you might have uh, that I don't cover in my presentation. Okay, so what is Zika virus? So Zika virus is a virus that was first found in 1947. And until very recently, this was one of the many, many viruses that scientists discover. We're sort of like stamp collectors in this way. We go out into the field, we take some animal or we take some person, we sequence all of the viruses that might be floating around in their blood and we catalog them and we put them into families, really just like stamp collectors. And the vast, vast majority of these viruses we then do nothing with. The reason is there's not nearly enough research funding and not real, nearly enough research interest to justify doing intensive research on every virus that we possibly discover. So typically what happens is someone discovers a virus and then does some basic research and asks, okay, is this virus one that is likely to make people sick? Is it from a family of viruses where its genetic cousins make people sick? And then we do sort of this risk triage or this risk assessment and we figure out whether a virus is likely to, to cause disease in, in humans or cause uh, economically meaningful disease in livestock. And then we, uh, we, we decide whether it should be subject to more research. And in fact, that happened with uh, Zika virus in the 1950s. This internet connection is apparently not working. So in, uh, in the 1950s, researchers did this sort of evaluation for Zika virus. And what they discovered was that if they put the virus through enough generations of mice, they could get a virus that, you know, if coaxed just enough, could make mice sick. But generally speaking, when they looked in people, they found that a lot of people had antibodies to Zika virus, but no one had recalled being sick. So the conclusion was that Zika virus was a virus that was endemic in Africa, but wasn't capable of making people sick. Now, in terms of its genetics, Zika virus is most closely related to another type of uh, virus uh, that you might have heard of called the dengue viruses. A dengue virus is a big deal, especially in tropical climates. So it's thought that about two and a half million people get dengue virus each year. And uh, I've never had dengue, to the, to the best of my knowledge anyway, but I'm, I'm told it's really, really unpleasant. And the thing that's most uh, troublesome about dengue is that the first time you get it, it can be pretty bad. It'll lay you up like a bad flu. But if you get dengue two or more times, each subsequent time you get dengue virus, if you get a different type of dengue virus, you can, be, uh, you, you, you can suffer from a hemorrhagic syndrome called uh, dengue hemorrhagic syndrome that, that can cause uh, really serious and in some cases fatal complications. So when we think about the viruses that are really closely related to Zika virus, we think about dengue virus, and one of the things that I'll come back to later is this idea that, that Zika virus, because it's so closely related to dengue virus, may be functioning in some ways like a new type of dengue virus. And so uh, this, is, this is something that we have to, to bear in mind. And one of the things as researchers that we did right away is we said, okay, Zika virus is most similar to dengue virus. So let's take the knowledge that we've applied to de for dengue virus and let's apply that to Zika virus and let's see uh, if we can just generalize to Zika virus what we know about dengue. And what I'll tell you in a little while is that there's a lot of things about Zika that are very similar to dengue virus, but there are also some critical differences that we have to be aware of when we're trying to figure out what we're going to do next with respect to Zika. One of the things that's similar between dengue and Zika is that they're spread by the same types of mosquitoes. So there's a type of mosquitoes you may have heard in the news, Aedes aegypti or Aedes albopictus. These are the same types of mosquitoes that spread dengue 
they also are capable of, of spreading Zika virus. But one of the key differences is that we now know that Zika virus can also be spread sexually, whereas dengue is not spread sexually. And this is really a unique feature of Zika virus because it's really the only mosquito-borne virus that we know of that can also be spread through sexual transmission. So what happens if people get Zika virus? Well, the two main problems that have been associated with Zika virus infection over the last couple of years are what's called Guillain-Barre syndrome. This is a, a, a disease of the, of the peripheral nervous system where people experience muscle weakness that eventually can lead to a, a, a paralysis. And this happens, we think, in about one in 4,000 people who get Zika virus. So not very common, but if you get it, it's, it's, it, it can be pretty devastating. The bigger issue, by far, is this association between Zika virus and fetal abnormalities. And we now think that approximately 30% of babies who are born to mothers who are infected with Zika in utero will go on to have some form of fetal abnormality. And one of the main research topics that's being pursued by our groups and lots of others around the world right now is trying to figure out exactly what abnormalities can be associated with Zika virus, what percentage of pregnancies are going to be affected, and what is it that, that modulates that risk. Is the risk greatest during the first trimester of pregnancy? Is it greater uh, in, in women who uh, have previously had dengue virus infection? There's a lot of unknowns right now that go into this uh, percentage, and in fact, scientists who are doing studies in different countries are coming up with different percentages of babies who are born with fetal abnormalities depending on how they define fetal abnormalities um, exactly what goes into their their definition and there also may just be differences in, from place to place in terms of how severe uh, Zika virus infection is. Nonetheless for a virus that a year ago none of you in this room had probably ever heard of causing something on the order of 30% of pregnancies to have fetal abnormalities is a big and scary deal. And so there is now a huge amount of, of, of research interest into Zika virus because we need to understand how we can mitigate this risk to especially to pregnant women and women of childbearing age who might become pregnant. So what sort of complications have been associated with Zika virus infection? Well, the one that's made the most news is microcephaly, which is a fancy way for saying babies who are born with unusually small heads. And oftentimes, when you watch news reports, you'd think that microcephaly is the only consequence of Zika virus infection, but it's not. Scientists have seen in babies who are born to uh, mothers who have Zika virus, uh, unusual calcium deposits in the brain, excess fluid in brain cavities and the, sur and the areas surrounding the brain, uh, missing or poorly formed brain structures, abnormal eye development, nerve damage, club foot, and unusually inflexible joints. So there's really a spectrum of birth defects that have been associated with Zika virus infection uh, during pregnancy. And one of the un great unknowns right now is whether babies who are born apparently normal to Zika virus infected mothers um, will eventually go on and have abnormalities that don't manifest until later in development, until the, the kids are one, two, five, ten years old. And so because the very first cohort of babies in Brazil born with microcephaly were only born last year, we really are going to have to follow these children for a number of years before we know what the full spectrum of, of possible complications uh, will include. And so I like to contrast this in some ways to HIV AIDS. So my background is as an HIV researcher. So I've been studying HIV for, for nearly 20 years. And in the earliest days of the HIV epidemic in the early 1980s, what doctors saw were people who had end-stage AIDS. Their immune systems had already collapsed. They were already uh, being uh, affected by these so-called opportunistic infections that people who have intact immune systems aren't susceptible to. And we then worked our way backwards and realized that people who were susceptible to opportunistic infections 
had likely been infected with the HIV virus on average about 10 years prior. And this, uh, this, this passing from getting HIV to developing AIDS has been a major uh, drag on our healthcare system because the cost of taking care of people with HIV has been so high. It's estimated that the lifetime cost of care is on the order of about half a million dollars per person. So when we start talking about Zika virus, I want to emphasize that we're right at the very beginning right now. So what we're seeing are babies who are being born with abnormalities now. We don't know what other abnormalities might uh, become manifest over the first few years of life. But this is going to create a lifetime commitment to care and in the case of uh, babies who are severely affected, um, economists have estimated that the lifetime cost of care might be more on the order of $10 million per infected person. So when you hear, uh, when you hear news stories where um, the government is, is, is discussing whether it makes sense to spend a billion dollars on a Zika virus response right now, it's important to bear in mind that every single excess fetal abnormality that arises due to Zika virus infection is probably going to incur a cost on the order of $10 million. And so it doesn't really take very many $10 million, infection, $10 million infections to get to the sort of billion dollar price tag that we're currently debating in terms of whether it's worthwhile to have a really robust response to Zika virus here in the US. So, now I've talked a little bit about the, the problems that can occur with Zika virus and about how often they occur. And so the big question that I want to know the answer to and many of you probably want to know the answer to is, well, what happens next? Where do we go from here? So first, I think it's instructive to look at where we have what's called active Zika virus transmission. This means that the virus is going from mosquitoes into people, back into mosquitoes, back into people. And what you see here on this map in uh, purple are countries where we have so-called active transmission. And what you can see is that with the exception of, 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 of Chile, the United States, and Canada, Zika virus transmission is occurring throughout South and Central America, as well as throughout the Caribbean, which is shown in the inset. So the mosquitoes that, ha that can transmit the virus are transmitting the virus in all of these different countries shown in purple. So this is going to be a problem that's going to be with us for a little while. Among the locations in uh, the Caribbean that are experiencing a Zika virus outbreaks, I think it does make sense to, 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 to pay special attention to Puerto Rico. Because Puerto Rico is a US territory, and there is a major outbreak of Zika virus going on in Puerto Rico right now. The way that they're assessing how bad the Zika virus outbreak is in Puerto Rico is by monitoring blood donors. So we knew that six months or so ago, if you were to sample 100 blood donors who came into a, 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 a give blood in San Juan, none of them would have had Zika virus. But over the course of the last couple of months, the incidence of Zika virus in blood donors in Puerto Rico has gone up and up and up. And if you extrapolate through the rest of the summer, the people who work in the blood banks think that approximately 25% of all the people in Puerto Rico are likely going to be infected with Zika this summer based on the prevalence and the incidence of Zika virus among blood donors right now. Now, what is that going to mean for people living on the island? Well, for the vast majority of people living on the island, it's going to mean nothing at all because, again, remember that Guillain-Barre is a very rare complication. And so if you're an otherwise healthy adult male or female and you're not pregnant or planning on becoming pregnant, your risk of getting Zika virus is very, very low. 90% of people who get Zika virus don't even know that they've been infected. And the remaining 10% might have a very mild, itchy, inconvenient rash for about a week. So if you get it and you don't have Guillain-Barre and you don't have uh, the concerns of pregnancy, the fact that a large number of people in Puerto Rico um, are going to get infected this summer shouldn't be too scary. In fact, it might actually be good news for a reason that I'll, I'll come back to a little bit later. Nonetheless, with 32,000 or so pregnancies in Puerto Rico each year, this, is still, this still leaves open the possibility that thousands of babies are going to be born with abnormalities either later this year or early in 2017. And in addition to the, uh, the health costs associated with Zika virus, 
There are going to be secondary costs uh, that impact tourism, blood transfusion, securing uh, the safety of organ and tissue transplant programs, and there's going to need to be an investment in mental and emotional health uh, for women who are pregnant and don't have Zika virus but have to carry this anxiety throughout their pregnancies. Additionally, and it's an uncomfortable po uh, subject, but uh, abortion politics, contraception politics are uh, going, to, going to feature in the dialogue about what's going to happen uh, in, in Puerto Rico with Zika virus uh, later this year. And in fact, I got a, a little bit of a preview of that uh, last week. Um, I was asked to, to speak before a Senate uh, committee hearing on Zika virus. And uh, you could see very much the alignment of the different political parties with respect to how they viewed the most essential ways of uh, combating Zika virus, uh, both in Puerto Rico and if the threat reaches the, the US. So I think that some of these thorny issues are going to come to the forefront. Um, and with this coinciding with an election year, uh, it's entirely possible that this is going to be a, a, a major driver of some news cycles between now and November. Now what about in the United States? So you've probably heard on the news people have talked about Zika virus in the US. And it's important to emphasize that right now, well actually these slides are about, as of about two weeks ago, there are a bunch of what we call travel associated cases in the US. So these are people who were traveling in Central or South America or the Caribbean. They came back uh, and they were diagnosed as having Zika virus upon their return. None of these cases indicate transmission from mosquitoes in the United States. But among these 755 cases are more than 200 cases in pregnant women. Now this is a bit of an over-reporting because uh, doctors are uh, largely only sending at-risk uh, women's samples off for definitive diagnosis because if you don't have Guillain-Barre and you're not pregnant or at risk of becoming pregnant, the fact that you come back with a Zika virus infection as a souvenir from your trip to Central or South America really isn't that big of a problem. And so uh, they're, they're, given the limited uh, resources available for testing, people who come back and are just curious whether or not they had Zika aren't having their samples sent off. So there is an over-representation of pregnant women in these statistics. But in the territories, which includes uh, Puerto Rico, we have the converse. There's a very small number of travel associated cases, but a larger number of, of cases where there is local transmission from mosquitoes into people. And again, a, a sizable fraction of these cases are in pregnant women. So this was a slide that I originally gave when I uh, presented a version of this talk a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think it was two weeks ago yesterday. So this morning I went back and I actually pulled the updated numbers and, I, and I'm going to show them here just to illustrate that this is a problem that continues to grow. So 755 became 934, 234 became 287. The number of cases transmitted by mosquitoes has grown from 1436 to 2020 and the number of cases in pregnant women has grown to, to 250. And these stats are current as of uh, about the last week of June. So what this means is that we, as we get into the height of summer and the height of mosquito season, we are going to see a major surge in the number of uh, Zika virus cases, both in US states and in US territories. Now, the million dollar question that I don't know the answer to, and I don't think anyone knows the answer to, is how much mosquito spread can we anticipate happening in the continental United States. So the first question is, do we have the mosquitoes? And the answer to that is unequivocally yes. So if you see here on the left, we have the host range of the Aedes aegypti mosquito, and on the right we have the Aedes albopictus mosquito. What you can see is that these mosquitoes are widely distributed throughout the southern United States, and they're particularly common in Florida and along the Gulf Coast. Now, if you look at the map, don't look at it, don't squint too much, because if you squint hard enough, you'll see that there is a little bit of an extension into the southern part tip of Wisconsin. Um, but remember that when they do these sorts of surveys, they will take the identification of a single mosquito in a tire as evidence that a particular type of mosquito is in a state. So we really don't have significant numbers of these mosquitoes in Wisconsin. So we really don't have to worry very much about local transmission here in Wisconsin. 
We do, however, need to worry quite a bit about it on the Gulf Coast in Florida and in Texas, because there, there are a lot of these mosquitoes. And we also know from uh, the, the dengue virus uh, history that it is possible for these viruses to be spread in the continental US. Now, one possibly reassuring feature of uh, our history of studying dengue virus is that in recent times, dengue virus outbreaks in the US have been relatively small and, and self-contained. There was an outbreak on the big island of Hawaii last December, um, but really uh, outbreaks of dengue are sporadic and, and typically brought under control uh, through intensive mosquito, uh, mosquito control measures. And that's probably because we do have better infrastructure than other places that are reporting significant uh, mosquito-borne Zika virus transmission. We have uh, screens on many to most of our windows. We have access to air conditioning. Uh, we do have uh, pretty good mosquito control programs, though I'm learning more and more that there's, there's lots of room for improvement there. So there are some reasons to think that because of our infrastructure, we are going to be better protected from local transmission of Zika virus than, uh, say, Puerto Rico will be. But we really don't know. And we also don't know whether Zika virus is transmitted more efficiently than dengue virus uh, by mosquitoes. And so we don't know how much we should be reassured by the fact that dengue hasn't spread very much uh, in, in the continental US. Uh, but clearly, if Zika virus does start spreading in the continental US, it will have similar secondary impacts, uh, not only on pregnant women who are going to have serious anxiety, but also tourism, blood supply security, organ transplant systems. It really is going to take only a very small number of cases to have uh, Zika punching above its weight with respect to uh, how it's going to, to be perceived. And for those of you who were, uh, remember the uh, small number of Ebola cases two, two years ago, uh, you can see and you can imagine how a very small number of Zika virus cases could lead to outsized uh, public anxiety. With that said, I think it's, 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 it's uh, quite likely that there will be at least some local spread. We don't know how much, as I said, uh, but I think that we can expect that there's probably going to be at least some. And um, as I said, even a small number of these cases could incur major costs. And um, this is going to be something that we're going to have to watch closely over the, uh, over the summer. So that's kind of a background on Zika virus and where we are as of right now. Uh, so what I'm going to do is spend the next bit of my talk talking about what we've been doing at Wisconsin to study Zika virus and why researchers in Wisconsin, who are nowhere near these mosquitoes, um, have managed to be very involved in the, the public health response to Zika virus. So the story starts um, with, the, with me and some of my colleagues who have been studying HIV for a really long time. And as part of our work on HIV, uh, we've been working internationally for, uh, with partners in, in South America and Africa for uh, a long time. These are sustainable, long-term partnerships. Here's a picture of me with my colleague Tom Friedrich, um, it, with our colleague Dennis Nansara, who's a pediatrician in Embraer, Uganda, uh, back in a, in, a, in a hut in 2010. Uh, and so we've been really involved in trying to uh, take this technology that we discover in our labs here in Wisconsin and use it to help our colleagues who are studying HIV around the world. So in addition to our work uh, in Africa, my longest standing collaboration internationally is with this gentleman in the middle, Esper Callas. So Esper is a clinician researcher at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, this picture was taken in 2005. You can tell I'm younger because I had more hair. Um, and I'm, I'm shown here with uh, my wife, who you could tell is smiling because she's been married to me for 10 fewer years in this picture than she has been now. Uh, and we have worked with Esper and his team on HIV, on dengue virus, on hepatitis C virus projects, going back to, to 2005. And uh, we have exchanges between scientists from our lab. So, uh, we go down there a couple times a year and show their scientists how to use the newest and latest and greatest tools that we've developed in our lab. They bring their scientists and clinicians up to Madison and uh, receive on-site training. And we learn a lot from them about how these infectious diseases are impacting uh, their, th their groups in, in Brazil. 
In addition to our work uh, in, in Sao Paulo, we also have uh, collaborators in Rio de Janeiro. And so here, once again, is, is my wife, uh, shown here with uh, Renato Santana. He's a professor from the, Univ the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, here, he was actually giving a Skype lecture with my undergrad class on HIV. So we were in uh, Florianopolis, Brazil, and he was talking about the Brazilian response to HIV to 100 or so undergraduate students uh, who, take, who take a class that Tom and I run uh, every fall. And you can see our son looking bored doing his reading in the corner. Um, so, this uh, same day, as we were uh, doing the Skype lecture, Renato came up to us and said, you know what, guys, um, I need your help because we have heard that there are a bunch of babies being born in the north of Brazil with really small heads. And one of the things that Tom and I have done in collaboration with Tony Goldberg in the, in the vet school over a number of years is we've, come, we've, we've collected those postage stamps. We've gone out into uh, the African uh, jungle, and we've sampled different types of monkey, monkeys, and we've looked for new viruses that haven't been discovered before. And so Hanato asked us if we could look in some of these babies to see if they had a new virus that was, that was causing them to be born with really small heads. And within a couple of weeks, uh, it was pretty clear that Zika virus was the leading candidate for uh, what was causing th these babies to be born with small heads. And so we turned our attention from uh, trying to figure out what virus was making the, the, the babies be born this way uh, to trying to figure out how we could understand more about this virus. Because as soon as we realized it was Zika virus, our next thought was, oh my gosh, we know nothing about Zika virus. And this isn't just us like, I didn't know anything about Zika virus, but I didn't. This was, as a community, if you looked in the databases that have papers, all the papers of all the scientific programs from around the world, there were something like 15 Zika virus papers over the last 50 years. There really was not very much known at all about Zika virus. However, it did make it pretty easy to get up to speed because you didn't have to read a whole lot. Um, <laughs> At the same time as we were learning about Zika virus from our colleagues in Brazil, um, Jorge Osorio, who's a professor in, in the vet school, uh, who also has had a long-standing research program in Colombia, where he's from, came back from Colombia and said, oh my god, we're seeing cases of Zika virus in Colombia. And so Jorge's lab was actually the first to describe Zika virus in Colombia. And so early in November, uh, Tom Friedrich, who had been talking to Jorge because he worked with him as a colleague in the vet school and had been talking to me because we were talking about Zika in Brazil, put this together and said, you guys really need to talk to each other. And so, so we did. Uh, and we decided that one of the things that was going to be really important in learning about Zika virus was trying to develop animal models that we could use to ask very focused questions about Zika virus uh, very rapidly so that we could inform the sorts of studies that were going to be done in people uh, but that are going to require very large cohorts are, and are going to play out over a much longer period of time. So after Jorge and I decided that we were going to start working on this together, we realized that we were missing uh, some, some, some critical buy-in. So fortunately, uh, I was able to convince John Levine, uh, who's the director of the Wisconsin Primate Center and is shown in the center here, and Buddy Capuano, who's the attending veterinarian and associate director for animal services at the Primate Center, that we really needed to start thinking about doing Zika virus studies with experimentally infected macaque monkeys, where we would give macaque monkeys a defined dose and, uh, and, and strain of Zika virus, and then follow what happens to those animals throughout infection. And fortunately, they both immediately understood the potential implications of this and offered the full support of the, of the primate center. And finally, this was sort of an, an embarrassing admission that we all had, is, but we, we realized that if we're studying a virus during pregnancy, we need to know something about pregnancy. And short of the fact that I have a son, that was about the extent of my knowledge of reproductive biology and obstetrics. So we needed to get specific expertise that could help understand the many dimensions of studying an infectious disease um, that infects uh, pregnant women and affects the fetus in utero. And so uh, Ted Golis, who has been studying uh, reproductive biology, reproductive health, 
and infectious diseases during pregnancy for decades at the WNPRC um, joined our team in early December uh, as the, the obstetrics component. And so we really have a multidisciplinary team that spans all of campus working on this. And then over the course of the next couple of months, our team has grown uh, to encompass even more dimensions. So here's Dawn Dudley. She's on the right. She's a senior scientist in my lab. Here we are down in Rio de Janeiro trying to help them process uh, some of the first Zika virus samples that they got in their lab back in February uh, to try to characterize what sort of tissues have Zika virus in them. Sally Permar is a colleague of mine from the HIV community. She's at Duke University. She contacted me in late December and said, I've been studying congenital cytomegalovirus infections in, uh, in, in women for the last several years. Have you heard about this Zika thing? And uh, so she's been part of our team bringing more expertise studying congenital uh, infections that can affect fetuses. Jorge has an extended team um, shown here down in Colombia studying uh, Zika virus and other mosquito-borne viruses. And as time's gone on, one of the things that's been just really awesome has been how much expertise we have on this campus that I had no idea about, to be honest. It's kind of embarrassing because I've been here since 1997. Um, we had people like Christina Newman, whose uh, job for a long time was to go set mosquito traps down in Chicago to capture mosquitoes. And when she came, she'd bring them up here to try to grow them in the insectary. But mosquitoes don't like growing inside, outside of their natural environment. So what she would do, because they wouldn't eat the synthetic food that she gave her, she'd give her arm out, and they would feed on her arm, and they'd take a blood meal. So they established the insectary using mosquitoes that were feeding on Christina. Uh, but she's become one of our local mosquito experts. Uh, and we've also drawn on a lot of the expertise that exists uh, in the medical school. Uh, so for one of the things that we want to do during pregnancy is look at how animals uh, develop during pregnancy. And to do that, the most sensitive technique is, is MRI. So here uh, you have um, Kevin, Kevin Johnson, who's a medical physicist, who uh, we recruited along with several maternal fetal specialists to help us look at the MRIs of developing fetuses. Again, we really were shameless in going out throughout campus and getting ex expertise from anywhere we could find it to help us answer some, some of these key questions. I think there might only be one more of these. Uh, these are two, these are two uh, 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 neonatal specialists who spend most of their time uh, looking at ultrasounds from human babies. Um, but they got trained. They, they went through all the rigmarole necessary so that they could come back and also use their expertise uh, to look at monkey babies. Uh, and try to assess whether there were any developmental, uh, developmental issues in, in the monkey. So it really has taken a huge team uh, to get where we are uh, right now. And so what we've been able to do as part of this team is develop the first monkey model for understanding Zika virus. And in summary, what we found is that mo macaque monkeys, which are the kind of monkeys that get used in most biomedical research, can be infected with Zika virus and exhibit similar symptoms to people who are infected with Zika virus. That is to say, most of them don't get sick at all. Uh, but they have the very similar trajectory of uh, viral response and immune response uh, as has been observed in people. We see that the virus is detected in the same fluids for about the same amount of time. And uh, critically, macaques have been used to study reproductive biology for decades. So unlike some other animal models like mice and rodents and guinea pigs, macaque pregnancies are generally very similar to human pregnancies. They can be broadly subdivided into three trimesters. Each trimester has key developmental milestones that track uh, very closely with those in, in humans. Uh, and so this actually makes it a very good model for trying to understand how a virus like Zika could cause uh, fetal abnormalities. So, I'm just going to show you a couple pieces of data from, uh, from, our, from our studies. Um, and I have one piece of really good news and one piece of not so good news. And so let's start with the good news first. The good news is that all the data that our group is generating and that others are generating uh, points to the fact that a Zika vaccine should be successful. So as someone who studies HIV and has studied it for a long time, 
I'm very gun shy about saying things like a vaccine should be successful because of course we said that about HIV back in 1984 and here we are 35 years later and we still don't have an HIV vaccine. But there's good reasons to think that making a vaccine for Zika should be conceptually easier than making a vaccine for HIV or other more thorny viruses. And so the reason we think that is because we infected a number of, and these are non-pregnant animals, we infected these animals with Zika virus. And what we did is we measured the amount of virus in the blood. And what you can see is that within one day of infection, there was some Zika virus in the blood, but that by about a week after infection, the animals had pretty much controlled their infections. They had cleared their virus. There wasn't any virus left. There were occasional very low level blips out to about 20 days. But for all intents and purposes, the animals had cleared their virus within, within a week to 10 days. We then waited another about eight weeks, so 70 days total, or 10 weeks from the first uh, infection. And then we gave them the same virus again. The question we were trying to test is whether the immune response that was elicited by this initial infection when the virus was replicating would be sufficient to protect the animals from being reinfected if they were exposed to the same virus again. And as you can see from the arrow where the, it says rechallenge, we saw no evidence of any virus replication after the animals were rechallenged with the same virus. So this suggests that the antibody response and that the immune response that got made against the first virus protects them from rechallenge. Now let's think about what the implications are for this in a place like Puerto Rico. It means that if you're a woman of childbearing age who's not pregnant right now, arguably the best thing that could happen for you would be to get Zika virus, develop protective immunity, and then if you get pregnant, you should be at significantly reduced, if not zero risk, for having Zika virus-related complications during pregnancy. It also means that if you are scared about uh, Zika virus, that the, the best thing that could happen would be for there to be a wave of Zika virus that comes through a community, leaves the entire community immune, such that the mosquitoes won't have vectors that they can use to continually uh, transmit the virus back and forth uh, between people and, and, and more mosquitoes. And indeed, in some of the outbreaks that we've been going back and looking at that happened in French Polynesia and in other parts of the Pacific in the last 10 years, that's what we've seen. We've seen huge numbers of people being infected in places like Yap Island, and then the virus goes away and isn't heard from again. And so this is, again, consistent with the idea that people have immunity. We don't know how long it lasts, but that they have immunity that protects them from being reinfected. That's the good news. The bad news is that some of our data also suggests that the risk to pregnant women might be even higher than uh, was previously appreciated. And our reason for thinking that is because in contrast to non-pregnant animals whose amount of virus in the blood is shown here again, so this is the same data that you saw on the last slide, um, when we looked at two animals that were infected in the, with Zika virus in the first trimester of pregnancy and two animals that were infected in the third trimester of pregnancy, we saw that in three of the four animals, there was a dramatically prolonged detection of virus in the blood relative to what we see in non-pregnant animals. And so this suggests that the risk to the fetus might be much higher than currently thought, in part because the virus sticks around a lot longer. So that provides a lot longer time for the virus to infect the fetus. Now, we don't know why the virus persists for so long yet, but one of, our, one of our leading hypotheses is that the situation is actually even a bit more dire than that, and that what we're actually seeing here in red are fetuses that are infected with Zika virus. The mom infects the fetus. The mom clears her infection because she has good immune responses, just like we see in the other animals, but the fetus doesn't. And so what the fetus is doing is shedding virus back into the mom. And that what we're detecting here is fetal virus that's, that's, that's detectable because the fetus and the mom are, are, are sharing the bloodstream. And if this is true, it suggests that you have a duration of infection in the fetus that can vary from about a month to two months and possibly be associated with, uh, with, with uh, adverse outcomes. So, what we're trying to do right now is to figure out what the impact of these virus infections is going to be on the newborn brains and other tissues. So this is always the part of the talk where I have to, where I have to say it's to be continued. 
because we're just now at the point where we are um, uh, delivering these babies by C-section. And then we're dissecting them to look comprehensively at whether or not there are any abnormalities in, in, in the newborn. Uh, and if so, where they're located, what tissues and organ systems are affected, how are they affected, and unfortunately, um, for the purposes of a presentation anyway, it's about a two to three week process to get the tissues stabilized and prepared for analysis. And so we're still in the midst of that two to three week process right now. So I don't have any information on whether the newborn babies uh, born to mothers who had this prolonged viremia have any adverse outcomes yet. But we should be getting that data over the next four to six weeks. We're also very interested in this idea that there might be interactions between dengue virus and Zika virus because um, the viruses are in the same place. Some people have speculated that if you have previously had a dengue virus infection, you might be at a higher risk of having a severe Zika virus infection. And this is something that we can model in animals much better than you can study it in people. People don't know what their dengue virus history was. They don't know when they were infected. They don't know how many times they've been infected. We can control that precisely by having animals that uh, are challenged with dengue virus and then go on to receive Zika virus to see if Zika virus is worse than in animals that haven't had dengue before. Additionally, just in the last couple of years, the very first dengue vaccines have been licensed. So Mexico has licensed the vaccine. Other countries have licensed the vaccine. And there's advanced clinical trials going on in a number of countries right now. So if natural dengue virus infection does change the risk of having adverse outcomes following Zika virus, what about dengue vaccines? If we vaccinate an entire population against dengue virus, are we going to modulate in some way what their future susceptibility to Zika virus is? Now again, for the vast majority of the population, I think I'd go ahead and vaccinate for dengue. But this is going to be something that we're going to have to think about when it comes to vaccinating women who could potentially be at risk of Zika virus in the future. It also gives uh, currency to the idea that we should really be focusing on trying to develop uh, combined Zika and dengue vaccines, though developing vaccines that target all of the dengue subtypes and Zika at the same time is a much bigger ask than making a vaccine just against Zika or just against one of the, the dengue uh, serotypes. The third thing that we're looking at right now is whether or not the virus persists in a replication competent form for longer periods of time in tissues than it does in the blood. So I told you that within about a week to 10 days, the virus is pretty much gone from the blood. But almost by accident, we looked at one of the mothers who had an uh, enlarged lymph node at the time that the, the baby was delivered by C-section. And we found that much to our surprise, there was still a detectable viral nucleic acid in the lymph node about two months after uh, the animal had been infected. Now, we don't know whether that virus is replication competent or represents sort of a viral fossil of an earlier infection. But you can imagine that especially for people who are trying to secure uh, the tissue and organ supply, it's vital to know whether or not tissues and organs that are going to be transplanted could be harboring Zika virus. Because while the risk to the general population is low, the same might not be true for people who are immunosuppressed because they're receiving uh, immunosuppressive drugs to tolerize them to a, a tissue or organ transplant. So it's really important to figure out whether this virus that we're detecting is actually capable of replicating and, and being infectious. So the last thing I want to talk about is something that I'm um, particularly proud of um, because it represented a bit of a, of, of a change in how we do science. And it really required the buy-in from our entire team uh, to, to, to do this. And this is the idea of, of real-time data sharing. Uh, and so this has been a, a concept that's been kicked around in science for the last several years uh, in light of some of the last major infectious disease outbreaks. It began right around the SARS outbreak uh, in 2000, 2001. Um, in 2009, when we had the H1N1 uh, pandemic flu, a lot of people were talking about the need to share data more quickly. And then some of the investigators who were studying West African Ebola really put this into action and made a lot of their data available uh, in close to real time through public repositories so others could go in and analyze it. In fact, one of the things my lab did was we took some data from West African Ebola patients 
And we asked a question that was totally different from the questions that the study authors had, had, um, had, had asked. And we had eventually got into contact with them and put together our own manuscript that basically looked at whether or not someone who was co-infected with a second virus had reduced susceptibility to Ebola. And so that was really a, 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 an eye-opening experience for me because it showed that the data that we're collecting and the data that we're generating, other people might want to use in ways that we could never imagine. And other funding and uh, uh, people who pay for the research and the journals that publish the research all fortuitously agreed in principle to this a statement on data sharing and public health emergencies back in February. And the idea was that we should try to make Zika virus uh, research as available as possible, as quickly as possible. And this goes um, to one of the real uh, problems with scientific uh, knowledge uh, communication in general, which is the long time from when data is collected until it's made available to the public and the rest of the scientific community uh, through published papers. And so the general process for doing a study looks kind of like this. You start the study, you do some experiments, you finish collecting the data, you analyze the data, you write up a manuscript, you submit it to a journal. The journal submits it to a series of peer reviewers who rake you over the coals and tell you your work is terrible, um, but that they are willing to publish it if you make the following 36 suggestions. You respond to these uh, individual comments one at a time, and then hopefully, eventually, uh, the reviewers are satisfied and the manuscript appears uh, as a published paper. So in the case of our initial Zika virus model uh, work, uh, that timeline looked like this. And this is actually a very, very fast timeline as, as research goes. We started our study on February 15th. By uh, March 15th, we had collected data from the first four weeks of infection. We wrote the paper over a process of about two weeks and submitted it to a journal. We responded to comments once we got them back in the middle of May. And then eventually, the paper was finally published uh, last week. So you're looking here at a time window of more than four months between the time when we started the study and the time that we ended up publishing it. And for a virus whose trajectory is changing as quickly as Zika that has such public health importance, this is simply too long. We can't afford to let data sit siloed in individual labs and at journal editors while people are continuing to get infected um, and that we have, especially when we have the greatest opportunity to, to intervene uh, and try to mitigate the threat. And I would argue that it's actually not particularly ethical to delay the distribution of research results for months during a public health emergency. So we asked, well, what could we do differently? Well, one thing that people in science have been doing is they've been publishing what are called these preprint servers. So at the same time as they submit a manuscript for publication in a conventional journal, journal they put a PDF of it online in these indexed preprint servers. And this is good because it saves a considerable amount of time. We posted our data in the preprint server the same day that we submitted it, which was March 31st. Uh, but this was still uh, quite a while after uh, we started the study, and so we took it one step further. And what we did is we decided to put all of our data online in real time. So this takes advantage of the fact that my lab actually has pretty good um, computing expertise and, and bioinformatics expertise. This would, model wouldn't necessarily work for everyone, but we were in a position where we were already going to be storing our data and making it available to the really large team of UW investigators I talked about earlier. And so we decided well, rather than restrict it by password or user ID to the people who would want to, to see it here at UW, we'll just open it up to the public and see what happens. It was a, a, a quite the experiment. Uh, but it turns out that it's been really quite successful. So all the data is uh, available, and information on all of our participants is online, along with how we've done the studies, the raw data that people can go in and reanalyze, as well as annotated data. So one of the things that we learned pretty quickly is that a lot of people who are interested in this data um, didn't really have a stomach to go in and analyze it themselves. So we took to writing brief summaries that kind of guide people through what the data means. Uh, and one of the people in my lab who uh, actually just returned from uh, giving a, to being a social media outreach expert at the Juno uh, Orbiter this weekend, uh, took over the lab's Twitter account when she realized I had no idea how to really use Twitter, which is absolutely true. Uh, and so she started putting some of that information on Twitter. Uh, and we actually started getting a lot of feedback. And one of the really neat things that's happened is 
other people have interacted with us about our studies in real time. And in some cases, they've uh, taken what we've put up online and given us suggestions about how we could do things better. So in the top example here, we had tweeted that there was some data that suggested that um, a number of the viruses that were called one thing, uh, one of them wasn't like the others. And this researcher from the University of Birmingham in England immediately wrote back within a few hours and said, yes, we also noticed that that sequence was wrong, but we actually have already taken it one step further and shown that it was a mosquito virus that was, that was incorrectly labeled in the database of viruses, um, not an actual uh, Zika virus uh, from a, a primate or a person. And on the bottom, you see an example where uh, the, the, uh, a woman who has led studies in human pregnancies affected by Zika, who's also seen uh, this idea of extended viremia or, or, or prolonged um, detection of virus in the blood, saw some of our data and suggested that we do some additional experiments that she wanted to do in people but that she wasn't able to do. So this has turned out to be really good. And if you're curious at looking, the URL is there, zika.labkey.com. And I'm just going to close by saying that I think that, in a way, uh, this is what Wisconsin and the University of Wisconsin is all about. Um, because if you think about what the Wisconsin idea is, it's the idea that uh, we take knowledge that's generated at the university and, and share it with the community for the greater good of all, and uh, really have knowledge that transcends the boundaries of the classroom, or in this case, the research lab. And, and so it's been really great to have uh, the University of Wisconsin uh, be at the forefront of this type of data sharing uh, and have uh, a team of people who are so willing to, to try something uh, that's pretty far outside the orthodoxy for uh, scientific research. So with that, I'm going to close by acknowledging um, just a small number of the people uh, who have helped uh, with this. In blue, you have the people who have been the project leaders in various parts of this. Don Dudley, Emma Moore is a pediatrician who uh, is a fellow in my lab and has brought a valuable clinical perspective. Tom Friedrich, who I've worked with for nearly 20 years um, on HIV, and uh, we're somewhat inseparable when it comes to doing this sort of work together. Jorge Osorio and Matt, who brought the mosquito virus expertise. Um, my wife and colleague Shelby, who did some of the virus sequencing um, in, our, in our project. Sally Permar from Duke and her team. Buddy Capuano, the attending vet of the Primate Center. Ted Golis, who led the obstetrics, uh, NIAD, uh, which is the depart part of uh, the National Institutes of Health, that when they learned that we were about ready to start these Zika virus projects, were able to use some unconventional funding mechanisms to provide support for these studies, as well as the Wisconsin National Primate Research Center, who uh, galvanized the studies by providing seed grant support. Uh, and then our colleagues in Brazil, Emil Cortinari and Renato Santana at the University of uh, Rio de Janeiro, and Esper Callas and his team at uh, University of Sao Paulo. So with that, I will stop and take any questions. Thank you. Right. So this is a great question. The question is, why now? And we don't really know. Um, there are a couple of hypotheses that we're exploring. Uh, the first is that in Africa, Zika virus is endemic. It's a disease of childhood. So for those of you who are a little bit older, you might remember being exposed to chicken pox at chicken pox parties before there was a vaccine. It might be the same sort of thing, where it's really consequential if you get it as a pregnant adult, but it's not really consequential if you get it as a child. Um, you develop immunity, the immunity lasts a long time, and you're protected as an adult. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that there are actually multiple different clades or types of Zika virus. The kind that we discovered in 1947 is an East African clade. It was discovered in Uganda. It might be that there are other genetically different types of Zika virus that are present in other parts of the continent, one of which got out and uh, migrated to, to Asia and then onward from Asia into the Americas, and that that version of Zika virus, that type of Zika virus, is fundamentally different, has a different what we call phenotype or behavior than uh, the Zika virus that was initially discovered in 1947. 
Uh, and there's also the possibility, and this is a, a startling one to admit perhaps, but we're not really good at, at surveillance in, in Africa. Um, it's much, much better now than it's ever been, but from the time the first cases of, HIV, of, of AIDS were described in San Francisco and New York and LA in 1981, it was four years until we knew that there was HIV in Africa. There were millions of people infected with HIV in Africa before it was even published that there was HIV in Africa. So it's possible that given the, the many issues involved with uh, maternal health and newborn uh, medicine and the high number of, of births with adverse outcomes in Africa that this, in certain parts of Africa anyway, that this was simply missed and was confused with um, other types of conditions that could also lead to birth defects and that it has been happening all this time and we just simply missed it. So those are three non-mutually exclusive possibilities and all three of those are being followed up by different groups. I think there's another question in the front. It's just a notice uh, that Scientific American, a major, one of the pieces of nature, has published a, a list of about 40 different uh, variants of Zika virus and the, and the history of when it was discovered. And, and, and they, they, they indicate there that the changes, the genetic changes, seem to be very, very minor between them, but there are enough there. But the question is, if they're so minor, could it possibly be that one of them is that, that more virulent? So, not clear why that would be the case. Yeah, so, so how minor, how big are these differences? So between the East African viruses and the viruses circulating in the Americas, the, the virus's genome is about 10,000 letters long. So you use 10,000, it's an easy number, round number. 10,000 letters long. The viruses that are circulating in the Americas right now are generally um, fewer than 10 letters different over 10,000 base pairs. So they're really, really closely related to one another. So all the viruses in Brazil, in Colombia, they're all very similar. Those viruses are about 1,000 nucleotides different from, or 1,000 letters different from the viruses in East Africa. So they're considerably more different from the East African viruses than they are from one another. That's why, that, that's one piece of evidence in support of this idea that there are very separate lineages of virus that may have emerged independently in, in Africa. But within the Americas, the viruses are all incredibly similar. So one of the things, I showed the picture of Don uh, and me in the lab in Rio. One of the things that we were doing was, was genetic surveillance of Zika virus in Rio. And we were helping our colleagues sequence different Zika viruses with the idea being we want to capture what the genetic diversity is. It turns out our group and a lot of others sequenced a lot of Zika viruses and discovered that they're all about the same that there isn't really very much interesting and obvious difference between Zika viruses that um, lead to fetal abnormalities and those that don't. They're, they all look pretty much identical to one another. But this is actually very good news because what it means is that any vaccine that gets made with any of these types of American lineage Zika viruses are likely going to elicit immune responses that are gonna work against any type of Zika virus in the Americas. So we don't have to have a special Zika Northeast Brazil vaccine and a special Colombia vaccine and a special Puerto Rico vaccine. If we have a vaccine that works in one of those places, it should work in all of them. In the back. I wonder if you comment on the challenges of team science, the different languages used and uh, different places for publications, if that was a challenge or not. Yeah, so, this is, so the question is, well, what about working in team science, and especially communication if you're working with people internationally? And I have to say that it's a challenge. Um, and it's a challenge we deal with every day uh, because when you have these cultural differences, uh, they can be comical, uh, but they can also be real significant impediments to getting research done. Um, and in fact, just last week, uh, Esper and uh, Milker, um, who are my two Brazilian colleagues, and Jorge, who's from Colombia, and I co-wrote an editorial in the science journal Cell, basically talking about simple rules for collaborating well with people from South America. Because one of the things you might not know is that in South America, every scientist communicates through WhatsApp, which is this messaging platform that is almost, I mean, it's used in the US, but it's really not popular in the US. 
But if you want to get the attention of someone in, in Brazil, you WhatsApp them. You don't email them, you don't call them, because they won't respond. You WhatsApp them, they respond to you right away. And this has been a, 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 an experience that many of us have had. So every one of us in my lab has WhatsApp predominantly to communicate with our Brazilian colleagues. Another one is, as, as a good Midwesterner, we're sort of averse to, um, we're sort of averse to physical contact. So whereas you show up in Brazil and the person who greets you at the airport to give you a ride to the lab embraces you in this big hug. You're like, ah, what are you, what is this? This is, and, and this is, everyone is hugging you and kissing you and you're like, I don't even know you people. Um, and you have to get used to that. And so that's, that's a, a, a bit of a, of a learning curve. And then you also have uh, issues where, uh, particularly in Brazil, there is a lot of bureaucracy uh, in terms of what it takes to get science done, ordering things to show up in the country, get, you know, ordering uh, kits or ordering experiments that we could do as a one-off here that I could think of the experiment today and do it by the end of the week can take weeks to months of planning. And so you have to first be patient for that, but second, you need to design your trips and design your, your uh, projects accordingly. So there's a lot that goes into doing these projects successfully. And then also making sure that your uh, colleagues are, um, are, are prominent stakeholders in what uh, one of my colleagues calls rooted science as opposed to parachute science. So you don't just go in and get the samples, bring them back, analyze them, and then acknowledge them, well, thank you for providing the samples. You have to realize that this is, this is you know, a health crisis that's affecting their countries, it's affecting their friends and colleagues and neighbors, and um, you have to engage them completely in every step of the process. I would say that I probably am on WhatsApp with Esper more than I talk to almost any of my American colleagues who aren't in my building uh, because that's how close we are working together on this. I've talked to him this week, what is today, Wednesday? Talked to him yesterday, talked to him Monday, Sunday. You get the idea. We, 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 we talk a, a whole lot. Um, and when we work here, one of the things is with such a big team, we have people who are really invested in the project because they're, they're, they're project leaders, but we also have people like the maternal fetal specialists who might only help on a couple of days and spend most of their time doing, doing other things. Uh, so one of the reasons why we, made all, we, we put together this whole lab key portal initially was to allow everyone on the team to have access to the data insofar as they were interested in having access. If they wanted to follow it, great. If they didn't want to follow it, fine. Um, but to make it available to everyone. We also have like a hip chat room, which is kind of one of these newfangled communications technologies where it's like a big group chat where people can again participate as much or as little as they want. So we try to respect as much as we can people's ability to be involved uh, at varying levels in the projects. It's a great question. Yeah. If you were to project uh, over the next year, three years, five years, where this is going, um, are you optimistic that we're going to have uh, deal with this problem effectively, or are the politics and other things going to impact this that it becomes a major catastrophe in certain parts of the world? Yeah. So again, I have to. I have to. Um, lean back on my experience as an HIV researcher and say that I have a really bad record at predicting the future, uh, along with the rest of the people in my field. Um, but I think that we can make some generalized predictions. In places where there's a lot of Zika virus now, I think we can assume that there probably won't be a lot of Zika virus in five years. So what we're looking at here is, is, is uh, roughly a five-year horizon, and what do we do over the next five years in places where there's a lot of Zika? And in that case, I think we need to be looking aggressively at vaccinating or trying to get uh, women who are of childbearing age uh, to avoid getting Zika virus during pregnancy. That can take a number of forms and different people of different persuasions. And again, I've learned this because I've been working in HIV for a long time. It's a charged argument and, and there's no one right answer. If a woman is abstinent, she won't get pregnant. We know how to prevent pregnancy. If a woman uses birth control, she won't get pregnant, by and large, if she uses it correctly. If we control mosquitoes, there will be fewer mosquitoes around to potentially transmit uh, Zika virus. If a woman avoids getting pregnant this summer, but goes outside in um, shorts and t-shirts a lot and doesn't wear any mosquito repellent, maybe she gets Zika virus this summer and then she's not uh, vulnerable next summer. One of the things that we really urgently need are home Zika tests so that women will be able to assess what their risk is 
during pregnancy and to know whether or not they've previously had Zika virus without burdening um, the healthcare system to answer that basic question. So the possibility of a combined pregnancy slash Zika test or some version of that, I think is something that might have a lot of short-term utility. Now what happens in the US is a, is a much trickier question. And I think actually the, the scenario here might be a little bit worse because if we don't have a lot of local mosquito transmission here, it could become a lingering persistent issue where every year we have some number of people who come back um, from vacations with Zika virus and um, that's going to be uh, particularly bad for, for tourism and, and relationships between uh, the U.S. and Latin and South American countries. I don't think we're going to have explosive transmission of Zika here in the South. If we do, the way that we'll know that is you'll start hearing news reports, particularly out of like Louisiana, Alabama, Florida, and Texas, of uh, surges in the number of, 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 of Zika virus cases. I, I think that's relatively unlikely, um, but what we have to do right now is navigate the next couple of years and minimize women's risk. And then within a few years, we'll probably have a vaccine that will be uh, suitable for use in travelers um, and uh, people who live in high-risk areas. But that's probably, best case, going to be three to five years off. Yeah? You said that you had um, some infant rhesus in heads. Did they have a normal So far, of the three that we've, uh, that, that we've looked at, all three had a normal head circumference at birth. But uh, at least in one of them, the brain was, according to our pathologist, a lot softer than normal. Now, I don't know what that means. That's the extent of what I know about it. That's why we have to wait the, the, the two or three weeks until the tissue gets fixed, and then they can slice it into very thin segments, and then they can look very carefully under the microscope at the, slot, at the cells to see whether the, the cells and the tissue architecture is normal or abnormal. We just don't know yet. But normal head circumference so far. Yes, that's an excellent question. So for the last six months or so, scientists have been looking at this issue of what's called antibody-dependent enhancement. And this is because there are four major global subtypes of dengue. And if you get dengue one, and then you get dengue two, um, your dengue two is going to be worse than it otherwise would have been. We think because what happens is your body has really nice antibodies to dengue one. And then when you get infected with dengue two, your body makes more really nice antibodies to dengue one. Um, and so we don't know if the same thing was going to happen with, 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 uh, with Zika. What someone published last week is that, at least in some cases, there's conservation between some of the sequences in dengue and Zika virus, such that there might be uh, partial protection in people who have had dengue before um, being more resistant to Zika virus. So it's one of those great scientific questions where it could be heads or it could be tails, and uh, we just don't know right now. Or neither of neither of them. It might not have any effect whatsoever. Yeah. Is, is there any spontaneous abortion occurring? Because I mean, it, uh, obviously the, the children that are born are going to be in, uh, have these these symptoms. But is there an increase in uh, failure, pregnancy failures in these particular areas that are infected with Zika? Yes, there have been a number of spontaneous miscarriages uh, as well as stillbirths associated with Zika virus infection. One thing we don't know is if women get Zika virus very, very early during pregnancy, how much uh, spontaneous miscarriage, which happens at a, a, a pretty significant frequency during early pregnancy to begin with, might be more likely to occur um, as a consequence of Zika virus. We just don't know yet. These studies are underway um, in South and Central America, and we'll probably start getting a lot of data from them within the next three to six months. Anti-Zika vaccines, there's at least 18 companies trying to make a Zika vaccine. I think there is now this perception that a Zika vaccine will be easy, and I think it's probably right. So pretty much anyone who has made a vaccine for dengue is trying to make a vaccine for Zika. Anyone who has a platform that's been used for HIV is trying to make a vaccine for Zika. Um, and it's a question of which ones of these are going to be resourced sufficiently to, to be tested in large uh, human clinical trials, uh, and how we're going to down-select 
those 18 different products to the few that we can afford to test in large clinical trials. So expect a lot of uh, politics to influence that decision, if I had to guess. All right, well, if there's no more questions, thanks very much for taking the time.